Hello. In this series of short videos, I'm planning to, to talk about my seriously pretentious Meisterwerk, The Rite of Spring, both how it came about and stories and secrets behind the actual tracks on the album. Now, The Rite of Spring was a long time in the brewing. Back in 2018, I had an idea gradually taking shape in my brain to produce a single cohesive concept piece based around a druidic Beltane ritual. I'd had some, some history of producing pretentious concept albums in the past from my days with Red Jasper doing things like A Midsummer Night's Dream and The Winter's Tale, albums that were collections of songs based on themes from those two Shakespeare plays. But with The Rite of Spring, I wanted to do something really quite different. Rather than have it as a collection of songs, the idea was to produce a single cohesive suite of songs and tunes that would tell the, the story of the coming again of the, the sun to warm us, warm the land and give us light, energy and fertility. It started off with a couple of small ideas which were uh, turned into songs and tunes and were like, filed away thinking at some point I will work on putting these together to make the single piece. And the starting point was uh, a piece which appears on the Rite of Spring but also is on my previous album, Toadstool Soup. That's a, a piece called Sing the Sun, which really expresses the, the core idea of praising, praising the returning sun for the gifts. I also had cooked up a, a jig, which I wanted to repeat and use through through the piece. Back in 2018 it was um, very much just filing bits away and being aware that at some point I wanted to produce the work. 2019 saw me quite busy. I was playing uh, decent festivals with Colin Lovelace and it was great to be getting back out and performing properly. I was also uh, engaged in recording a very different type of album, Toadstool Soup, which uh, was released in 2020 before uh, The Rite of Spring, was a collection of songs rather than a, a single concept piece. All the songs fit together. The album has a a definite identity, but um, my task in hand wasn't sitting down and writing uh, a new album, it was to be getting out and performing to promote, promote the one that I had on release. And things were looking good. I did a gig on my birthday in 2020, the 1st of March, played at the Wharf in Tavistock, which is a, a great venue, great sound, had a thoroughly good, enjoyable gig. And the following day, Colin Lovelace drove me across the country. I got on board Pendragon's tour bus, and the following night opened for them in Paris. And I was smugly self-satisfied. I had a, a jolly good album out that was being well-reviewed, and I had a diary crammed with 
good gigs. Big shows in Europe, playing um, France, Belgium, Holland, Germany and Poland. And then, then it all unravelled. I was pretty fortunate to make it back to England on the last flight out of Poland before they shut the borders. Pendragon suffered dreadfully with their tour being trashed by um, countries going into lockdown. And what I'd assumed was going to be a busy summer of top festival gigs secured because of having uh, done, done well at festivals the previous year, suddenly it just wasn't happening anymore. I could have got pretty miserable about it. I certainly don't claim that I was happy, gaiety and smiling. My income was shredded and something that was important to me, playing music, just wasn't an available option anymore. However, rather than sink into a big pit of despair, I looked at what I could achieve rather than what I was being prevented from doing. And I thought it was time, rather than just have the right of spring as a, a few hazy ideas out there, it was time to bring forward the recording project with it and turn it into a, a proper piece of work. I wanted to base it on a druidic Beltane ritual. I'd been studying things connected with druidry and I wanted the, the discipline of having a, a framework to fit the songs and music to. And the pieces as you go through the album are very much elements that you would find within a druidic ritual. I didn't want it to be a pastiche sort of pre-Christian pagan work with all oldie worldy acoustic instruments. I wanted it to be relevant to now and because of that had some particular sound ideas in mind. I wanted to produce an electric album, whereas um, Toadstool Soup had been very much an acoustic album. I wanted to have a, a continuity to it. I looked at a particular instrument that I wanted to use as like the coat hanger for the work playing the tunes, the harmonic structures, and providing a, a framework for other musicians to layer their contributions onto. And to this end, I had actually commissioned um, a little while before um, an electric octave mandolin, which a chap called Andy Tobin built for me and I wanted to, to get to grips with that to make it part of the, the sound. I bought it with a clear conscience. It was an expensive piece of kit, but I was regarding it um, as a, a tool of my trade. I had plenty of gigs and festivals to play through 2020. Unfortunately, um, it turned into a rather a different experience, let's say, and my tool just wasn't being used. It certainly wasn't making any money and it was time to do something with it. I started off laying out the, the elements, the constituents of the work and I um, had the tunes and some of the lyrics and some of the uh, musical structures written. I laid it out as a, a piece from beginning to end and was then going to look at working on 
finishing all the the ingredients, the, the tracks, the pieces within the suite. So although I'd thought of it as a, a sequence, I didn't write the parts in that sequence. Certain things came first and helped me frame the structure of the work. I put time in, finished the lyrics, finished the tunes, the harmonic progressions, and uh, did some work with my young son, Sebastian, who had a, a, a sensible enough home recording studio. We recorded the pieces and had viable demos that I could then send off to other people to look at getting their contributions and having their creativity contribute to the album. And it was quite um, interesting and difficult, really, working out who was going to be involved with the album. Covid was making um, travel very difficult, and it was really seriously demotivating a lot of people. Initially, I sent the demos for the piece off to a, a chap that I'd met at open mic nights in Sirencester, one Daniel Billing, who I realised was A, a jolly good bass player, but also someone with his own creativity. He's a great songwriter and uh, performer on instruments other than bass. And I wanted um, someone who could put on um, a head that would let him understand the whole point to, to the album. Initially, I think Dan was a bit sceptical, thinking, why would I want to work with him when I was um, some strange old Kelty folky character and he with his bass playing, was more likely to be sessioning for heavy metal bands than for, for folk ensembles. But I thought the way he played was perfect for my music. I don't want a dum-de-dum-de -dum conventional folky sound. Although my uh, music is very obviously rooted in traditional folk music, the end result really isn't aimed at typical folkies. I wanted to make an interesting, different rock music with its roots in traditional Celtic music, but not a typical folk rock work. And Dan's incisive, rhythmic, percussive, melodic bass struck me as a, a perfect fit for what I wanted. I'd worked in the past with a, a great violin player, Martin Solomon, but uh, Martin was struggling a bit, I think, with the, the lockdown problems, and he had gone off to the south of France, I believe, for a, a while. I was struggling to get hold of him, and I was aware of a, a great girl fiddle player, Jilly Hotston. I'd worked with her in the past because she'd deputised for Martin on a few occasions in my old short-lived Celtic rock band, The Poor Beagles. And I liked her playing style. It was very um, fiery and quite dramatic. And I thought, yeah, I reckon that'll work. And I sent her off some demos. She was very quick to react. It was, wow, this is absolutely wonderful. Count me in. So with Dan and Jilly, I had the, the core, the, the basis of the, the band that was going to produce the album. Whilst some degree of travel was possible, I headed off to uh, Rick Connolly's Beehive Sounds studio near Liscard in Cornwall. I knew 
Rick from the past. He recorded and produced Toadstool Soup for me. And uh, like Colin Loveless, he was actually a member of the, the Druid group that I belonged to, Corrix Grove. And I was sure that he would lend a, a sympathetic ear to the project of producing a Druidic Beltane ritual. And I started off just recording the bones of all the tracks. Electric octave mandolin via uh, effects pedals and uh, a martial stack and vocals and some percussion to give a, a framework that then others could bring their skills to. I had some quite specific sound ideas in mind and had driven down to um, visit a chap called Ali Carter, Alan Carter, who's the guitarist in a, a pretty serious prog rock band, The Emerald Dawn. And I wanted some help with um, getting the right and appropriate sounds out of my Boss GT8 multi-effects processor. And Ali, I knew, had the same piece of kit. And fortunately, my vocabulary was able to uh, express what I wanted well enough that Ali was able to engineer those sounds, which I then took into the recording studio. The bones of the album were recorded and Rick Connolly um, had MP3s which could be exported and also ran me off um, a bunch of CDs. And the idea had been for others to then come into the studio for us to work together and get their parts layered in to the Rite of Spring. The corona restrictions had other ideas. It made travel difficult. It made associating with other people difficult. We wouldn't have been allowed to have been a, a bunch of musicians in a confined space in a recording studio. Um, trying to sing whilst wearing gas masks isn't really a, an option. It ended up with all the other parts for the album being recorded remotely. Daniel Billing did his bass parts in his sitting room. Jilly Hotston's fiddle was recorded, some of it, most of it, in my garage in the Cotswolds, some of it in uh, Jilly's sitting room or dining room in Southampton. We got Sahila Clifford's backing vocals recorded in Dan's kitchen in Sirencester. And Collie Coletta Giovanni set up a, a vocal booth and recorded her duetting vocals in her bedroom with a, a decent mic and straight into to her computer. Tree Stewart, who played the keyboards, that was done at Dragon Studios, the Emerald Dawn's studio in St Ives, in Cornwall, and then Rick Connolly had the unenviable task of putting together a whole pile of disparate pieces and turning them into a coherent album. And I take my hat off to him. He did a, a fine job with that, and we, we ended up with the Meisterwerk, the Rite of Spring, which in other film clips, I will run through tales about the tunes, the lyrics, the songs. Till next time.